So I want to do a brief history of the labor movement. That's that's kind of where I want to start with this um, with this stream here, because the current climate towards labor actions is pretty fucking negative, right? Um, and by the way, uh, before before I, I, I go into it, I, I want you guys to leave comments and I will look at them at the very end of each segment. Uh, that that is something I'm still going to be doing. So so feel free to leave comments. Feel free to, uh, you know, let people know that we're doing this and stuff. Um, and then uh, and uh, yeah, we will. Uh, we will get right into it. So, um, yeah, so the. the the rhetoric that you hear towards socialism, towards labor actions, is just a lot of hostility, and it's a lot of lies, right? There's a lot of anti-union rhetoric that's out there. Corporations are allowed to to, to just straight up be anti-union. Um, and there's major propagandas that claim that, oh, the unions are going to sell out your rights, right? And the only time that they do sell out your rights is when unions side with corporations and and we'll 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 get into that uh in the second segment here but it's basically a gaslighting campaign right it's it's to they they hit you with this stuff so much non-stop where where it's just constantly fed that oh if we enact socialism if we r increase the minimum wage if we start helping workers you know it'll be this awful thing and and your rights will be gone and you'll have less freedom and everybody has to wear the same thing and everybody has to do the same thing and you know uh, I if you don't want to be you know it's this whole thing of like well if you if, if you let people do whatever they want everybody's just going to be artists and it's like that's not true that's not true a lot of people uh, might want to go into a trade that, you know, it, they might want to go into medicine. They might want to go into the sciences. Uh, a lot of people don't because they're, they're discouraged to, because quote, there's no money in it. Right. So we give up happiness for, um, for, 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 you know, this manufactured financial stability. Um, and I say it's manufactured financial stability because, uh, things like the arts, things like uh, science, education, and th uh, you know, are are kneecapped on purpose in order to discourage people from going into those uh, into those fields. Sorry, my sinuses are acting up just a little bit. But what people don't realize is that we had a really strong union presence in the early 1900s during the Great Depression. Actually, we had a really strong. Uh, union presence. And that was because of the 1935 Wagner Act, which gave unions a lot more legitimacy. It allowed them to to collectively bargain for the worker a whole lot more uh, than than we are today. Um, it gave uh, it gave employees and workers a living wage during the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, a lot of people were um, were able to uh, uh, make a living wage, right? And they were able to collectively bargain. Uh, corporations were taxed a lot more. Um, and uh, uh, the people's lives were, were, were okay because of that. Now, a lot of people are going to make the argument that, oh, it was because FDR did it. FDR was this big, great uh, champion of the labor movement. He was the big, great champion of the uh, of the working class. This is what happens when you put Democrats who, uh, you know, kind of have some mild socialist leanings, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in their politics. That's what happens. We need more FDR style uh, leadership. And, you know, in, in some degree that might be true, but in reality, it's, it's mostly false. Um, the Wagner Act did not get signed because FDR was uh, was a, a great champion of the working class, that he looked at what was going on uh, in the factories, in the industries, and said, hey, we should really be treating workers better. That's not why any of this happened at all, at all. Um, it happened because in 1934, there was a wave of general strikes that happened all across the country. And I did a big show covering a lot of the labor actions, uh, you know, from 1919 to, into the 20s, into the 30s. Um, and, and basically in 1934, to kind of give you a short summary of that, there, I mean, there were general strikes everywhere. Minneapolis, Toledo, San Francisco, uh, Washington, right? All across the country, there was waves of these general strikes. And what did the FDR administration do? Well, they didn't say, well, let's, um, let's listen to what these workers really have to say and, uh, and, and go from there. 
No, he sent the military after them. He sent the National Guard. He sent cops for uh, after them. And he carried on the tradition that both Democrats and Republicans before him carried on, which was to attack the working class, attack citizens of this uh, of of his own country um, in order to suppress the worker movement, in order to support capitalists and corporations, right? The bosses knew that um, that if if the labor movement was successful, that they would lose a lot of money, that they wouldn't be able to uh, have a shit ton more wealth than the working class did, right? That's that's why you saw the rise of the Pinkertons. That's why you saw the cops being used uh, as a weapon against the working class. That's why you saw the military being used as the weapon against the working class. This wasn't done because of Democrats. This was done because the labor movement put so much pressure on them through general strikes uh, and through labor actions. And even though the National Guard was sent in, the the strikers started fighting back and the and the uh, the public opinion of the country was shifting like in minneapolis for example when they had the trucker strikes farmers uh joined in solidarity and would just give them food instead of like selling it to you know larger corporations or anything they would just be like here we're gonna feed the striking um the striking truckers to support their to support their message to support what they're saying right so the 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 climate was changing to say yeah maybe, the, maybe you know these workers do deserve more these workers do deserve better uh work conditions and a better living wage and and so on and so forth so because of that fdr had to if he wanted to you know make sure that the democratic party could survive into the 40s and 50s he had to change the law. So the legislation was written because of direct action. Direct, you know, direct action, legislation didn't change anything. Direct action changed everything. Direct action was the thing that forced the legislation to move further to the left. So, so this whole notion that like, oh, well, we have AOC and we have Ilhan Omar and the squad and all these people in, in, in within the Democratic Party, and now they're going to shift the Democratic Party to the left. It's not true. It's never been true. You could have the most leftist populist person within the Democratic Party and they'll get co-opted and, and run, you know, uh, 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 just straight down that fucking corporate line without really encouraging direct action. Right now, AOC did uh, encourage direct action in the very beginning, but she's not doing so anymore. That's kind of that's kind of the major critique of AOC uh, in a lot of respects. So. So, there, again, there was a bipartisan push. There was a bipartisan push against labor activists, against strikes, against organized labor. So, um, and then you had cops and corporate mercenaries like the Pinkertons to try to end these strikes. And you had Woodrow Wilson, Glover, Grover Cleveland, FDR, Calvin Coolidge, even and even Teddy Roosevelt that used military force against the workers. Glover Cleveland specifically, uh, Eugene Debs led a rail railway strike, uh, the American Railway Union led a strike in order to improve work conditions and pay for railroad workers in the late 1890s. And Gl Grover Cleveland sent the military to stop them and, and opened fire on his, uh, you know, on, on American citizens. And the military caused 18, or, I'm sorry, $80 million worth of damage. $80 million worth of damage. Uh, and the spin was, you know, what, the spin was similar to what we see today for Black Lives Matter protests, which is, oh man, look at the damage that these people cause. Oh, we're against rioting. Oh, we're against, you know, the, this sort of violence. They 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 shifted the narrative and made it all about how the the, the workers were causing the violence when really the workers were in in retaliation. They were defending themselves. Uh, against a military occupation is essentially what was happening there, right? So, so 1935, the Wagner Act gets signed. Unions get a lot more power. Workers get a lot more power. Workers' lives are, um, are, 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 are better because of unions, and that's statistically true even today. Um, workers that join a union and are represented by a union. Uh, and uh, co companies that have union presence usually mean that workers get paid better, uh, 
and they get better treatment at work. Uh, and corporations aren't able to essentially uh, treat workers like hot garbage um, and treat them like throwaways because there's a union presence there. So we go to 1947. That's the next uh, kind of major landmark in terms of what happened to unionization and what happened to organized labor um, in, in America. So you had two Republican congressmen and a Democratic pr uh, president that uh, depowered the union with the Taft-Hartley Act. Basically, what the Taft-Hartley Act said is, uh, you know, unions just can't exist. Uh, they have to be approved by corporations, and the way that corporations can approve the unions is basically by having the workers vote. Um, the, the workers will vote for whether the unions uh, need to exist or not, and at any point, the corporations can pull the unions regardless of uh, worker vote. If the union wants to do anything within this corporation, um, they have to get approval, but corporations can discourage people from joining unions whenever they want, right? So this is basically where and why you see a lot of anti-union rhetoric from uh, co companies like uh, Walmart, for example, Sam's Club, right? A Amazon, Target. Um, I, I think even Trader Joe's has had some um, uh, anti-union rhetoric where, where they said that they would fire employees if they tried to organize. Uh, Starbucks did, has, has anti-union rhetoric because of that. Um, you know, the, the, the place that I work is, is kind of in, in the gray area where uh, it, it depends on the client they work with. If the client wants unionization, then, you know, the, the, the folks uh, get unionized. But if you're not in, in, in a position where the client wants unionization, then you're not allowed to join a union. So, you know, this sort of stuff is, has been legalized because of a Democratic president. Harry Truman was president when the Taft-Hartley Act was signed. And uh, this is one of the prevailing reasons why Dwight Eisenhower, who again, not a, not a perfect person, but Dwight Eisenhower was being groomed um, to run under the Democratic Party. And he didn't know if he wanted to because he was a military general and he really didn't have any sort of uh, party alliances, right? Now that's changed. Now, uh, you know, you do have military people uh, high-ranking military officials that do b walk party lines, right? They're the other side with the Democrats or they side with the Republicans. Regardless, it doesn't really fucking matter because they're pro-war anyway. Anyway, the, the point here is um, Eisenhower looked at how Truman treated the working class and said, look, if 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 you want me to join the, the Democratic Party, then you're going to have to do something better here. Um, the way that you're treating treating the working class is unfair. This is this is not the way that we should be uh, trying to run the country. Uh, and then he said, uh, "All right, well, I'll join the Republican Party and run as a Republican." And he won. Uh, and even under Eisenhower, it was like a ninety percent uh, corporate tax rate. Um, now there's an argument for you know, and, and they're calling Joe Biden this FDR style Democrat, which is not true. Um, you know, now we're, I think we're like, it's like a 28 or 20 something percent corporate tax. Uh, it's, it's like less than a third of what it was in the fifties and sixties for corporations. So in 50 years, we have cut the corporate tax, um, down to a quarter or less of what, than what it was, um, in, in the fifties and sixties. So it, you know, you, you can objectively say that there is a, a lot more corporate control, uh, of of our government and our politics in America, and you can you can it's very evident to see that. But that's why that's why Dwight Eisenhower ran as a Republican and and won as a Republican rather than a Democrat, even though he he probably lined up a lot more with with the Democratic Party at that time. But because I mean one of the reasons why he was because the Democratic Party wasn't supporting workers. That's why he bailed out. Uh, and you know you kind of see how corporations can get away with the shit that they get away with because of the Taft-Hartley Act, because of because of how uh, presidents after uh, Democrat Harry Truman, and I want to keep saying Democrat because uh, I want people to realize that throughout history, it is it has been Democrats that have very much um, betrayed the working class. Um, the Republicans never, you know, the, the, well, the Republicans started as more of a socialist party. And then because of William McKinley, they became the party that we know today, right? The, the more 
uh, religious, militarized, racist party that we see today. Um, but it was the Democrats that sp like specifically went after uh, the labor movement. You know, uh, for example, Ollie Hansen, who's seen as this hero within the Democratic Party for stopping Bolshevism in, in 1919, was a, a, a Democrat that called the uh, National Guard uh, to come and fight unarmed striking workers that were, you know, working together to feed people. And during the general strike of 1919, there was way less crime in the streets. Uh, people were just taking care of each other. And even, even the National Guardsmen were like, we've never seen this city run more efficiently than it is right now. Like, despite the fact that there, there, there is a general strike going on, like the city is still running efficient and far more efficiently than under the under the direction of uh, of of Ollie Hansen. So, um, you know, it's it's important to note that that there has been a history of Democrats that have attacked the working class. So, you know, uh, and, and Republicans, bo both parties, there's, like I said, there's a bipartisan effort to squash the labor movement. Um, but because of, because of Harry Truman's actions, you, you see why Amazon is able to get away with what they did. We just saw Bessemer, Alabama, uh, the warehouse there trying to unionize. And you got to see the, um, the pushback, right? The pushback of, uh, of Amazon against unionization, because if because if they unionize, they can start asking for better pay. They can start asking for PTO. They can start asking for better health insurance, right? Which health insurance shouldn't be connected to work anyway. And if it is connected to work, you shouldn't have to pay for it out of your own paycheck. Uh, the corporation should take that expense, right? Like that's the point of having employee employee owned health insurance. Uh, but that's not the case, you know, in a lot of instances, it's it's a couple hundred dollars every month out of a paycheck anyway. So so at the end of the day, it's like, why would I choose to use employee health insurance if it's coming out of my pay anyway? Right. There's no benefit to it. Um, but you see why they can get away with it, because the Taft-Hartley Act essentially made it legal. Uh, and and at. Every single turn, there has been opportunities for people to overturn this, but nobody's ever, ever done it, right? Uh, Obama didn't do it. Clinton didn't do it. Clinton actually made things worse with uh, with, with NAFTA uh, because it, that just allowed corporations to uh, move factories into, into Mexico, into Latin America, and pay those workers way less because... You know the minimum wage in those countries weren't what what they were. There there were less worker laws uh, in place, worker safety laws in place there, and 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 they and it, that allowed them to take advantage of that, and it still allows them to take advantage of that. That's where the anti-immigrant rhetoric comes from, right? Oh, they're stealing our jobs. No, corporations are giving the jobs away. That rhetoric in and of itself is a lie. But you see Amazon using anti-union tactics like daily texts, weekly um, anti-union meetings where they talk about, oh, how evil the fucking unions really are and so on and so forth. Um, and they manipulated people to to get their votes. Um, they uh, they would tell people like the wrong dates for voting. So they would panic and have to make a decision right away. And, you know, um, things like that. They would change the they, they changed the traffic lights in Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama, so that the workers didn't have time to meet in the parking lot and talk about labor action, talk about strikes and things of that sort. Um, so you really got to see that sort of stuff. And and all of that, all of this stuff is legal because of the Taft-Hartley Act, because there's really been no president, either Democrat or Republican, that has tried to overturn this and, and given unions a little bit more power and given organized labor a little bit more power to come to the table and say, you know, hey, this is this is the, the struggle that we're facing. We need paid time off. We need hazard pay. We need increased pay uh, for, for all of our working class. Um, and we need, you know, thing, uh, raises on a regular basis to match the cost of living uh, so that so that uh, the, these workers um, are getting paid the equivalent of uh, at least covering their their basic needs. So, you know, that that is not that's not happening because nobody's overturned Taft-Hartley. 
And again, um, you know, these workers are not asking for something astronomical or something that's like beyond the scope of of reality. It's living wages, better health care, paid time off, better work conditions, things that should be happening anyway, especially in the in in the greatest country on the world, right? The most industrialized place on the planet, where everybody's dreams come through, and and the streets are are, are paved with candy and and dreams and love and all of that shit. They're not asking for unreasonable demands, but th but what this would do is it would make the workplace be led by logic and compassion rather than just profits and ruthlessness and that's that's the reason why uh corporations are against it because it would it would kind of close that income gap and now corporations are going to have to like actually fucking take care of the workers and instead of jeff bezos getting closer to being a trillionaire you know maybe he's just a single billionaire which is still an astronomical amount of money being a singular billionaire is still an astronomical amount of money, but it doesn't matter because capitalism is about endless wealth in a in a planet with limited resources. That's why it's a that's why it's a catastrophic and cancerous economic plan, um, and it doesn't work. And nobody should be in support of it, especially if you are pro, you know, like living, <laughs> like capitalism will lead to our ex uh, extinction um if we if we don't uh you know rein it in and start thinking about uh logic and compassion and empathy so and that's why people are against these unions and that you know th th this history is not taught in schools i don't remember being taught any of this stuff in schools i had to learn this on my own um and that's why i wanted I, that's why i keep talking about it that's why i talk about things in a historical perspective um because it, I, I think when you put things in a historical context, people can kind of see how long this shit's been going on. The battles we're seeing now are just carryovers from battles that that were fought in the early 1900s, right? Like that's you you know you 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 have uh, like the UAW strikes that are happening now, the Hunts Point strike that happened in January, uh, the, the the strikes that are happening in India right now uh, with the farmers, all of that stuff. All of these are carryovers. The tactics that these people use haven't changed. It always starts with, oh, is it a peaceful, nonviolent protest where people are 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 marching and chanting and and you know organizing and and having speeches and trying to change the the mindset of uh, of of pe propagandized people? Well, great. Send the military out there, and then we'll and then when they retaliate, we'll paint them as violent. This has been going on for for at least 200 years in this country and when you put that in that perspective i think people can kind of understand it a little bit more they can visualize it a little bit more and it becomes a little bit easier for people to say hey maybe i've gotten things wrong you know i had no idea this is a perspective that i i that had never been you know uh brought to my attention before so um that's that's why I, I I like to take a historical perspective on it. Uh, I'm gonna look at a few comments. Uh, Holly, the Reagan destroyed Patco air travel. Not the same since. Uh, I'm not familiar with Patco. I will have to look that up. But I'm assuming that has something to do with uh, with striking um, air travel employees. Yeah, the business unions. Uh, what's actually funny is after the uh, the general strike of. Uh, the Seattle general strike of 1919, the businesses, the big businesses in Seattle got together and formed their own like bosses union so that if any company was facing like union action uh, or, or like any sort of labor action, like let's say Corporation A is, you know, there's a bunch of strikers that aren't going to manufacture lumber uh then the other corporations can get together and, str and strategize against um the strikers and usually again this involved things like the pinkerton so the business unions do exist like there are business unions uh the cio also a corporate union that's not uh really on the side of the worker there we'll, we'll get to that in the next segment here yeah uh and again the labor movement gave 40 hours work weeks weekends off they ended child labor mother jones was specifically somebody that uh fought against child labor there um 
in reality, FDR saved capitalism. Yeah, he had family members that were uh, part of the banks. And at one point, he had an opportunity to strengthen the Postal Bank, which was a pro, uh, pro-worker pro uh, bank, right? They, they were able to give out people better loans with better interest rates. Um, and again, they were connected to the post office. So they were kind of um, this socialized bank that would have helped a lot of people. Uh, and that was kind of the point of the Postal Bank. But he he killed it. Um, by uh, by putting more regulations on it and uh, introducing the FDIC and trying to, to, to legitimize uh, the Fed a little bit more, the Federal Reserve a little bit more. So he was a capitalist through and through. W- was he as ruthless of a capitalist as someone like Woodrow Wilson or Harry Truman or Ronald Reagan? Probably not, but you know he didn't do great things. He he did things because the, the the public perception of things were changing, and if he didn't change with them, um, then that means that the Democratic Party doesn't get elected again. So you know he was still he was still kind of a a, a party man. Um, you know, yeah, uh, corporations giving jobs away again. That's that's another rhetoric that's used to pull away from socialism and kind of glorify capitalism a little bit more and uses, um, a, you know, uh, immigrants as a scapegoat there. Clinton did what Reagan couldn't. Yeah. And Nixon, um, Nixon was somebody that, uh, Bill Clinton would often get advice from. Um, so Clinton kind of carried over both, uh, uh, Reagan and, and Nixon's agendas, um, and in reality, you know, the, the the biggest success that Clinton had was pushing the Democratic Party over to the right. Right. They wanted to be the tough on crime. So so Clinton and Biden are really responsible for pushing the Democratic Party over to the right. Uh, and, and then which forced the, the Republican Party to become even crazier, to become even more fascistic than they already were. Uh, and, and again, the, the Clinton royalty is is responsible for doing that. Uh, Petco is the air traffic controllers. Oh, okay, I think I have a vague memory of of reading about that. Um, I I will have to get a little bit more d- into the details of that, but that that might be a good topic for uh, a future future live stream. Um, Climate Rebel over on Rockfin, thank you so much for the tip. I really appreciate it. Uh, it says I belong to a strong union in the '70s before they crushed them. Uh, only time I experience real democracy. It's why I'm profoundly favor of direct democracy. Uh, hashtag direct democracy. Hashtag we the people can do much better than this. Yeah, I, again, there there is a ton of research and a ton of statistics that point out that when you join a union, a union that is specifically built for the working class, a union that doesn't side with corporations, that doesn't have any sort of political ties or political agendas, or isn't trying to funnel people into a, into a party, it helps the workers. Their lives are better. They have a stake in the company that they work in which means decisions just can't be made without the workers approving it. The bosses have, it it, it is, it is democracy, right? Like it does, it does kind of have that worker co-op mentality, which Dr. Richard Wolf talks about a whole lot is democratizing the workplace and having that kind of solidarity and that kind of democracy where, where your voice as a worker is actually fucking heard rather than rather than just be about servitude like this is why people say it's wage slavery you are getting paid to do a job but you have no control over what that job is you have no control about the policies of the company uh if the company decides hey we can save a couple hundred thousand dollars a month by moving our factories to china um and 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 following their work laws where they might not have the same sort of minimum wage requirements um, and and worker safety requirements that America does. Well, we'll just move there and nobody in, and nobody in the company has a say in it. Uh, and then we'll use the media to kind of spin this thing of like, oh, well, you know, it's because immigrants are coming here and the companies have to do the right thing. Well, none of that kind of shit can happen with the union where workers are are directly involved in those decisions. Um, and, it, and it creates a happier workplace, right? Like you feel like you're more important. You are more engaged you, and, and now workers are more productive. The company. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button and please make sure you share this content out. 
Sharing is very important. Sharing is how independent media gets the word out there about topics that corporate media doesn't even want to mention on their networks. So it's really up to you guys. Corporate media very much depends on the people. We are people powered media. That's what we really are. Uh, another great way to help if you're on stable financial ground is to uh, make a financial contribution to this channel. And you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets, early access to videos, bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling content, uh, a way for you to communicate directly with me, ask me questions, and other uh, premium content that uh, will be released on a monthly basis. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well on that same website. Um, I also have uh, various stand-up comedy albums. I have about six comedy albums out right now uh, that are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. And most of them, if you get them off Bandcamp, are available for a dollar or a, a pay-what-you-want pricing. And I also want to mention that I do have an online merch store. Uh, you can go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, click on the merch tab, and check out all of the designs that I've made myself. And the Julian Assange shirt, there is a Julian Assange shirt that's on the website. All the profit from the Julian Assange designs will be going to uh, pro-Assange activists, such as Action for Assange, uh, Kevin Gastola, Richard Methurst, folks uh, 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 that, that are covering and talking about Assange. So I'm going to be making donations to them. Um, uh, it'll be 100% of the profits I make off of that shirt. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again to all the people that have made contributions to the show, that regularly check out my content, that have subscribed to my channels. I, I very, very much appreciate it, and uh, and you guys help keep this uh, keep keep this this train a moving. So I, I very much appreciate that. Until the next video, we'll see you on the road. See you guys. The company starts doing better. Uh, you know, the products are made better. The consumer gets uh, gets better products. And now this person can help uh, the, the economy, you know, the economy grows. So all in all, again, there's just more benefits than, than not to having unions around. <laughs>